So um, our speaker for this morning's session is Barbara Fleck. Um, Barbara has a specialist in-depth knowledge in the fields of antibody therapeutics. Um, so please do use this uh, session as an opportunity to raise any questions or challenges that you are currently facing uh, in this area. Um, and in addition, you can also reach out to Barbara on the conference app. So um, the, the topic is, is uh, potentially a, a, well, it's an extremely relevant one, I was just saying to Barbara before we, uh, we kicked off this morning, given the, um, the, the, the increase in the numbers of biologics and, and therapeutics and uh, that, that are in, 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 our, in this space. So it'll be really interesting to hear from Barbara on um, the best ways to uh, protect these technologies, um, potential challenges and, and how to overcome those. So just a, a word on logistics. So if you can please keep your microphones on mute during the presentation, that would be much appreciated. Um, if you do have any questions, then the chat box is enabled. So please use um, the chat box to submit these. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on, on those and I can um, uh, pass those to, to Barbara um, at the end of her presentation. And then just to highlight, as you will have heard, uh, it is being recorded and will be available as part of the on-demand content for the conference. And I think we are, we are keen to have um, an interactive session. So um, please do, don't be shy. And I think potentially Barbara might throw some questions your way as well. So um, I hope you enjoy. And, and with that, I'm gonna hand the stage to you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alicia. So just to, um, oh, I'm afraid my slides are not moving up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so just to, uh, start the um the session i mean there's, there's a little bit about about me here um as alicia said um, my my firm is called apple at least I'm, I'm based in cambridge and i have a particular interest in antibody technologies um, i've worked with many clients in the antibody field for many years and i was also um in-house uh, with a company called crescendo biologics which some of you may know based on the babraham site where I was head of IP for some time. And in fact, I'm still acting for Crescendo. So I've, I've always had a keen interest in antibodies and platforms used to, to generate antibodies. It's, it's really one of my hobby horses, even though I also deal with other matters in the, the life sciences field. These, these presentations for these workshops are a little bit tricky because of course I don't know what your expect experience is in, a, a, in specifically in the antibody field. So some of you may actually know quite a bit about protection for antibodies. And um, I know, for example, Laura uh, from Cambridge Enterprise is, is very well versed in, in that field. And, and some of you might not know as much. So I, I'm trying to address different levels with this presentation but it's probably pitched at a more basic level. That said, if you have any questions and you want to go a little bit further and have a bit more of an in-depth discussion, this is supposed to be a workshop. So I'm really happy to take your questions. As Alicia said, please enter them in the chat box and Alicia, please interrupt me if there's questions. I'm really happy to be interrupted. But also we are such a, a small group today. I, I absolutely, don't mind if you just would like to unmute yourself and just ask me questions while I go along. I'll try and break a bit between slides to enable you to ask questions, but, but really I'm very happy to be, be interrupted. And if there's anything I can do to make this more relevant to you, then I, and I'd be really happy to do that. Um, just you know, to kick this off, if anybody would like to share their, their experience or perhaps set their expectations, what, what they would like to learn, perhaps you have had quite a bit of experience in um, antibody IP or you've come across some difficult issues and, and you just would like to share that. I'd like to give people an opportunity to unmute themselves and perhaps just jump in and, and, and give us a bit of a, a background why, why they're interested in protection for antibodies and perhaps what kind of issues they have encountered, what they'd like to learn about. And I'm very happy to you know, pitch, and pitch my um, presentation a little bit differently and take account of your, of your um, actual experience and, and your 
um, things that you would like to hear about and learn. So if, if I might just invite you to, to just comment, if there's anybody who'd like to comment, please feel free to do that now. Well, good morning. This is Dave. I work at Arsigenica. So not too far, of course, from the uh, URH Crescendo site. Mm -hmm. So I'm relatively new to the antibody field, but I've been involved in IP managing portfolios in the past around biologics. And um, I know there can be such a complexity of FTO and people think it's a very black and white scenario. And of course, you learn to live with shades of grey and risk, really, <laughs> particularly as things become more complex. So obviously you go from composition of matter. One could argue that's relatively straightforward, but I'd be interested in your views on that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's the whole how you develop through the process, the formulation to the final product, which will give you know the, the absolute comfort and certainty that an investor wants. Um, yeah. But of course, that becomes more and more, I think, tenuous. But um, yeah, interested mm -hmm. to learn more about it, particularly around antibodies, which there seem to be a million ways to do the same, attack the same problem. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I'll bear that in mind when we when we come to FTO in the second part of the um, presentation. Thank you very much for those points, David. Barbara, this is Laura here from Cambridge Enterprise. Hiya. Um, I would just like to say it would be really good to learn a bit more about how we can really get the inventive step on antibody patents. Mm, and I think we've talked about this briefly step. before, but mm -hmm. often we're, we're going for targets that are known and we're using well-established techniques in generating the antibodies. So it's learning more about what the, the differences we can generate through the inventive step are. Yes. That would be really interesting for me. Yes, absolutely. No, that is such an important, important point, Laura. Thanks, thanks for that. And I do have a, a few slides. And as everybody will, will see, um, this is really the most difficult um, side of things. Inventive step at the EPO for antibodies is, is really quite a steep hurdle. Thanks. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Um, no, I don't think so. Let's move on then. Um, I put a summary here on this slide. So first I'll be talking about patents for antibody technologies. I'll give you an overview of the kind of things that can be prote protected. What are the challenges? And I'll talk specifically about um, inventive step. As, as Laura's just said, that is, is quite um, difficult. And I'll give you a few examples of the types of claims that grant. I have to say that my focus will be on Europe. I will say a few words about the US, but I'll mostly focus on European law. In the second part, I will be talking about freedom to operate. And as, as David has just said, freedom to operate is, is um, quite a complex exercise and there are lots of moving parts. And I'm hoping I can give you a few tips on how to approach freedom to operate and what to bear in mind really when, when doing this exercise. Hopefully that, that will give you a bit of a, a, a practical idea of um, how uh, FTO can be carried out and what, what you need to consider. So of course, we're all here because we have an interest in, in antibody technology. So I probably don't need to tell you how important antibodies are and um, how many antibodies are currently used as therapeutics or as um, agents for detection. I mean, we've, we've all seen it with COVID treatments. There are now COVID treatments based on uh, with, um, antibody therapies. I believe that Regeneron have a an antibody cocktail that, that is used to treat COVID, but obviously we've seen a great success of antibodies used for various conditions and, and Umira um, it has been one of those um, antibodies that's actually really quite well known. It's, it's um, such a successful drug um, having generated an awful lot of money since it launched in, in 2003. Now, with the success of antibodies as therapeutics, of course, also comes um, IP, and there are a lot of antibody-related patents out there. I put up some figures here. 2019, more than 2,000 antibody-related patents were issued in the US. About half of that number, 1,000, were issued in Europe. And of course, with so many patents being issued in that field, that creates a large body of prior publication of prior art, which 
um, applicants will need to face when they develop their own technologies and particularly antibodies against a known target. And we'll, we'll come to that and discuss that in, in more detail. So in terms of what can actually be patent protected in the antibody field. So there, there, there are various related technologies that could warrant patent protection. Of course, you need to fulfill the various requirements. I'll come on to that. But just in terms of the technology, what kind of patents are we seeing related to antibody technology? Platforms for making antibodies, for example, transgenic mice. Some of you might have followed the uh, litigation between um, Chimap and Regeneron. And the subject of that litigation was, of course, Chimap's transgenic mouse platform for generating antibodies. There are, of course, other players, many other players, in fact, in, in that area, um, producing either transgenic mice, transgenic rat platforms, um, or in, in fact, uh, there's, of course, other methods, phage display, etc. There, there's quite a lot out there, and, and these are very, very valuable um, platform patterns. Then composition of matter. So the actual antibody, an antibody that binds to a specific target, that, that is perhaps the holy grail. It's, it's a really important type of claim that provides a patentee with um, a very broad protection. Antibody fragments um, are also very popular. Um, so different formats could be protected, either certain antibody fragments or in fact formats that are um, where fragments are put together in a very clever way to achieve a, um, a particular binding molecule with advantageous features. You can think of, for example, um, the byte format. Antibody formulations can also be protected. So companies often seek to increase their footprint and prolong patent protection for their um, flagship um, molecules by filing additional protection around their core molecule. So if you have been able to obtain a patent for your antibody, patents have an expiry date of 20 years after the filing date, then it is a good idea to try and protect um, related embodiments so that you try and prolong that patent protection beyond the 20 year term. So that's where antibody formulations come in. So as the actual drug that's being administered to the patient, that might be in a particular formulation. And that also is something that can be protected. Typically, antibody formulation claims are, are quite narrow. The excipients have to be specified in some detail, but such claims do grant and give additional protection against any um, infringers or generic companies. Methods for making antibodies can also be protected. Um, of course, there are already so many known methods. So in, in order to protect um, a method, something has to be genuinely novel and, and inventive about that method. Something has to be different and it has to be advantageous. There are also methods for optimizing antibodies. So making certain substitutions to um, uh, in, increase uh, functional features and if you can find a generic way of making such optimized antibodies, then such a claim could be quite broad and in, in fact quite powerful, giving you quite powerful protection. So I, 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 we have seen this in, in um, the antibody space where there, there are claims where um, antibodies are claimed that have certain substitutions in certain areas, for example, in, in the VH region, and these substitutions are said to, to be particularly useful, perhaps they decrease immunogenicity or have other effects, then that could provide you with quite a generic and broad claim, not linked to the specific antibody, but actually to any, any optimized antibody that has those substitutions. So that, that can be powerful. And then there are, of course, uses of antibodies. So using antibodies as medical treatments. And sometimes it is perhaps possible to find um, a new use for an antibody or perhaps a new treatment regime. So either the antibody is used for a new indication or it is used for um, a known indica indication, but 
um, with a particular treatment regime that provides a, um, an advantage to what was previously known. Or the antibody is used as a combination therapy with another therapeutic agent. And perhaps there is a synergistic effect which makes that combination therapy particularly useful. So I'm, I'm not claiming that this list is exhaustive, but it it's, gives you a, a good idea of the different types of subject matter that can actually be protected. So when we talk about antibody technologies, we, we mustn't forget about um, areas of protection that are not the antibody per se. There could be other um, inventions that you might have made in the course of developing the antibody that actually in themselves could lend themselves to, to patent protection. So maybe the, the method that you have used to make the antibody, maybe you've made certain modifications that actually are, are useful, could be applied to other antibodies. So all of this warrants consideration. I should also say that perhaps not everything lends itself to patent protection. There are some um, developments that you might be making in your R&D department, which may not actually be protectable with a patent, or you may choose not to protect them. So, so I've already talked about methods for making the antibody or methods for optimizing the antibody when you actually include that information in the application you need to give some detail because you need to show how the antibody is made and that should be reproducible it certainly is if you give the sequence of the antibody the antibody can be made but there might be some slight tweaks to certain methods that you have used i'm really talking about the detail here and the kind of um, perhaps even concentration of various solutions that you have used and you decide that that perhaps should stay as a trade secret and that's not being disclosed. Maybe because actually the improvement compared to known methods is, is pretty incremental. So you wouldn't be able to get a, a patent for such an improvement because you it would be something that is that it's obvious to play with concentrations of certain solutions, say when you do various essays. But these essays are important and they, they give you a um, uh, perhaps a bit of a competitive edge. So you might choose to keep those, um, that information as a trade secret. I mean, all, all of that needs to be carefully assessed when you prepare the patent application and when you get the inventors to, to write up the data um, and actually have that discussion with the inventors. You know, how did you do this? Is this standard? Is there something special about it? Sometimes when um, I get the information from the inventors and I read through it, um, you know, that seems fairly standard to me, but then having a discussion with the inventor, I'm, I'm often surprised how much can be drawn out of these discussions. Perhaps there are some surprising elements that even the inventor hadn't quite appreciated, but when you have that discussion with the inventor, it, it often transpires that, well, yeah, this was quite different. I actually used this and this, this made a difference to the method. And, and perhaps those, those areas um, are important as, as trade secrets. So now we, we come on to requirements um, for patentability at the EPO. I just want to very briefly stop here just in case there's um, any questions that, that, that people might, might have to, um, on, on what I have talked about so far and the, the kind of areas where one might have a patent. David, I can see you yeah. unmuted yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I think, you, you know, Thank you. Lots of good points. And, and I think the one you talked to there was the inventor and, and teasing out things which they go, well, you know, one plus one always, always equals two because they've, they've discovered that. They don't see, they think it's obvious and actually it's not yes. always obvious to the rest of the world. And, mm -hmm. and how do you, you know, I think you probably won't talk to today, but information, making sure they don't give their opinions on the invention disclosure sheet and so forth that say, well, actually, this is a whole load of rubbish or I don't believe in it or et cetera, et cetera, really. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, really key early step in, in on this journey. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the conversation that's really important. Um, I, I think um, when the inventors provide invention disclosure statements, 
um, they're often quite precise uh, on those and quite keep it quite brief. And I think it's really drawing out that information in a conversation where you can really sit down and you can drill down onto the, the actual steps and really ask the inventor, well, how did you do that? Was there something different about it? Was that, yeah. was that totally routine? Why did you think about using this? What, was this something you read somewhere? And with, with those asking the right questions, a lot of information can, 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 can actually be extracted from the inventor. And you, you're quite right. I think inventors often um, might not appreciate that there is an inventive step in um, a, a particular um, experiment, a particular action that they have taken. And you said it, every, everything is obvious to them. I, that, that certainly sometimes is true. And it's a little bit about um, conveying to the inventor that actually, actually there are certain principles under which inventive step is discussed. And um, something that might strike you as obvious isn't perhaps necessarily obvious when it comes to the formal assessment of inventive step. So, and you made a good point in your previous slide about trade secrets and the high commercial yeah. value of a trade secret as well and making that strategic decision whether you can keep it a secret as well yeah so. yeah i think um, we often see this um i mean this this feeds into the antibody space now as well um in in where there are inventions where you use um sort of computer imp implemented inventions so you say you use some clever software and algorithms to actually Id identify um oh, t-cell epitopes or, 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 or something to do with the antibody space actually that there's a case i've worked on it was t-cell epitopes and um, um sometimes even though it, it is as actually possible to um to protect um algorithms in certain certain jur jurisdictions you may not wish to go down that route you, you may not you may want to protect the end product but you don't want to protect that process which use some clever computational bioinformatics you want to keep that to yourself you don't want to give that away so so that could no. be an example yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you. um barbara just oh, to um sorry to interrupt there is a comment uh which kind of ties into dave's last mm -hmm. comment around trade secrets so mm -hmm. um simona said can you please provide more consideration about the trade secret approach um i don't know Simone, if you wanted to unmute to to elaborate or um, Barbara, if that's enough for you to. Yes, I mean, the trade secret approach is, is obviously something to consider, as, as we just discussed with, with David's comments. The only only thing I would like to add with the trade secrets. You have to carefully police that, because obviously, if you have a, a number of people working on certain um, projects, if there is something that you haven't put in the patent application or you're not seeking patent protection for, you haven't disclosed in any papers, you're not disclosing at conferences, it is actually a trade secret. It's, it's, it's really something that's locked away in the safe. It's a, it's a secret. Then everybody needs to be aware that that is the case. Employees come and go, we all know that, we all know that but these people need to be aware that uh, certain aspects are actually secrets and of course, when scientists go to conferences, the whole idea is that they interact with the community and, and share ideas, etc. But it's it's very important, I think, to make sure that if there are certain aspects that are considered a trade secret, that you do not disclose these trade secrets because otherwise, obviously, they're no longer they're no longer secrets. And it, it's it's very important that employees know that. You know, it could be a way of, you know, your expression system that you use, or as I said, certain certain ways of um, computational approaches that you use. And, and if these are trade secrets, they shouldn't be talked about um, in, in any setting with um, third parties outside the company. So that's that's the that's the issue with trade secret to actually keep keep it secret. Also, if you go, if you look at um, sort of further down the line, if you have to make submissions for regulatory approval, etc., they might make it in the public domain. Can you reduct certain um, information? Otherwise, if that's in the public domain, that was supposed to be a trade secret. It's no longer a secret. So, so it's, trade secrets are a little bit challenging, and you need to think carefully about what might leak out in the public domain. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Uh it looks so, yes, Simona. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, 
Okay, so coming on to the requirements for patentability at the European Patent Office, the EPO, there are certain requirements that inventions have to fulfill to be granted a patent. And I, I'm sure most of you have heard of these. So an invention must be novel. That means um, it must not have been disclosed before. Um, what does that actually mean? Well, this disclosures can be um, any anything that was conveyed to the public before your filing date of the application. That can be a presentation at a conference. It can be another patent application that has published. It can be a scientific paper. It can be an abstract. It can be a blog on the internet. A anything that was conveyed to the public. A public disclosure is not um, something that you convey to a third party under confidentiality agreements. So of course, it's always important when you speak with third parties, you haven't filed a patent application to make sure that you are discussing anything to do with your invention under confidentiality. Um, when I talk about prior art, that means any disclosures that were made prior to the filing date of your application. So that, that we refer to as prior art. An application, um, and it, uh, the, the claims of an application, so invention must also be inventive or non-obvious. So that means that, um, a skilled person would have found it obvious to simply make what you describe as your invention. So if there are certain prior art documents which hint at your invention, um, then these can be used against you and are cited for inventive step on the basis that an examiner will say, oh, well, this document already suggests that you can do X, Y, Z. It doesn't disclose it, it doesn't actually make X, Y, Z, but it suggests it. it, it, it motivates a person to make X, Y, Z. It creates a, a clear pointer to do a certain thing that is the subject of your invention. And then there's a problem for inventive step. I'll, I'll come to inventive step in some more detail because as, as Laura said before, this is really critical for antibody related inventions. Now, an invention must also be sufficient or in the US they call it enablement. That means that a skilled person, so that is the, the person who works in the field, has the technical abilities, should be able to carry out the invention when reading your patent. So you need to describe the invention in such a way that a skilled person could actually go away and do it. So an antibody must be sufficiently described so that the skilled person could actually make the antibody. So that, that is a, a requirement. Of course, I should say, if the patent is in force, someone makes the antibody that is the subject of a claim, that would obviously be an infringement if that person didn't have a license to do so. But of course, after a patent has expired, then anybody is free to practice the invention. It's basically called the sort of the patent pact or quid pro quo. You are granted a patent by the authorities, but at the same time, you need to disclose, fully disclose and explain how you arrived at the invention and how the invention can be carried out. That's a fundamental principle of patent law. Your, your claims must be clear. Um, you must have support in the description for what you are claiming. Very similar to this requirement of sufficiency that you, you, you need, need to, to, um, to actually show how you arrive at the invention, how it can be practiced. And then there are also some exclusions from patentability that don't really come into play um, for our discussion, but, but just to flag this to you, that there are certain areas um, which are um, prohibited, for example, um, a mental act. So if, if you simply compare sequences on paper and then choose optimized sequences, that, that's something you can do in your head and such a method wouldn't be patentable. There has to be a wet lab step, essentially. There are more exclusions under US patent law that are perhaps relevant <coughs> generally, um, but we're focusing on, on, on Europe today. So now a few examples with um, antibodies. So if you have discovered a new target, fantastic. Not many people do. Um, if you have a new target, you can also protect an antibody that binds the target in a broad way. So, so that, that that's sort of um, principle has been around for a long time. It, 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 it still stands, um, though those claims can be obtained. The problem is, of course, that very few people actually discover a new target. I think um, a, a lot of companies look at established targets, for example, IO targets, 
Um, and, and those targets have been around for some time. Antibodies against those targets have been around for some time. So simply claiming an antibody to PD-1 is not novel because there are a lot of antibodies out there against PD-1. So you need to include some features in the claim which specify what your antibody is. So what one way of or antibody is or antibody does in terms of functional features. So one way of doing this is to actually define the structure of the antibody. And under European practice, you need to define all six CDR sequences of the antibody. That is the guidance by the EPO. Um, you do not have to define the full length sequence, although sometimes examiners seem to suggest you have to, but you can argue against that. But you definitely have to define the six CDRs for full antibody. If you have a single domain antibody, then you've got to define your three CDRs. So it's the structural features, and those structural features should give you novelty, because if you have a truly novel sequence over a known PD-1 antibody, then by defining those CDR sequences of your antibody, you're, you're giving, you're demonstrating novelty. There's a, there's a new structure, a new sequence. It's different from the known antibodies. That, that fulfills your novelty requirement, at least. So what, what about functional features? Um, functional features such as um, binding affinity, um, internalization, inhibition, all of these functional features, you could also define in the claim in, instead of the CDR sequences. But I have to say that that is very difficult to, to get such a claim at the EPO. So if you have an antibody that binds to PD-1 with a certain affinity, it, it is really quite difficult to get such a claim granted if you only have that functional definition without your CDR sequences. And the reason being, and I just quoted this from the guidelines, but you, you don't have to, to read this. I'll summarize it briefly. The reason being that um, an, an examiner may simply suggest that the art already discloses those functional features. So in other words, if there are PD-1 antibodies out there, um, you have to show that they don't have the same functional features as you're claiming. Of course, if you rely on the CDR sequences in combination with the functional features, that, that gives you a much better argument because your sequences should be novel over the existing antibody. So perhaps the message here is, when you claim an antibody to a known target, you have to define the structure by reference to the CDR sequences. Relying only on functional features will be very difficult, but you can rely on structural features, so the CDR sequences, together with functional features. That, that's really the message here, which is what I put on this slide. And if you rely on that, you might be able to get um, a bit broader with the CDR sequences. So rather than actually specifying them exactly as they are in the molecule, you might be able to get away with a certain percentage sequence identity if you combine the CDR sequences with the functional features. What about epitopes? Can you have an antibody that binds to PD-1 binding to a certain epitope? Now, again, at the EPO, extremely difficult, extremely difficult, because you have to show that the, the prior art antibodies don't bind to the same, anti, to the same epitope. And of course, that is almost impossible, because you will probably get a lot of prior art cited if you use a popular target like PD-1 or LAX3 or any other IO target. Um, and you, you, these disclosures may not say where the antibody binds, so you don't have any idea where the epitope is. Um, also, in terms of the language of the claims for a linear epitope, the examiners at the EPO now require that you use closed language. So you have to specify exactly the epitope. Um, you have to say the epitope consists of. So that is closed language, which specifically defines the residues of the epitope, which is very narrow and also you have to be really sure that that is correct because if you actually later find out that the epitope doesn't consist of those residues maybe there are additional residues then you run the danger that your claim doesn't actually cover your product so that's obviously something we all want to avoid the message here is just relying on epitope is is really difficult at the epo it's always been difficult but it's i think it's become more difficult 
now inventive step. So here is really the the the, um, the most difficult area in this inventive step is um, if I would sort of say when when um, I discussed the topic with one nucleus and um, Aline said to me, oh, but is it different for antibodies than in other areas? And and actually, I think it is, particularly on inventive step. I think the EPO is really strict with antibodies on inventive step, stricter than for example, with new chemical entities. Um, so what is an inventive step? As I said, it's it's considering whether invention would be obvious in view of the prior art and the common general knowledge at the time of filing. Uh, at the EPO, the examiner will look at um, what problem is solved by the invention and if the invention would have been obvious in light of the art. And, and you must also provide evidence that you have actually solved the problem. This goes back to having data in the application that you have made the antibody and that it has this, the properties that you claim it has. So when we file applications um, to a, an antibody against a known target, the examiner will often say, OK, you've made another antibody um, against LUX3. That's great but it is routine to make antibodies, you have merely created an alternative antibody. There's nothing special about it. What are the advantages? That's something the examiner might come back with. And then you need to explain what the advantages are. You may need to put certain features in the claim. And all of this needs to be backed up by data. So Laura, this comes back to the point, sort of what, what are the kind of things that could make an antibody special? And I've listed a few things here. It's not an exhaustive list, but it could be improved affinity, improved therapeutic activity, reduced toxicity, unexpected species cross reactivity, um, a new type of antibody format, which has some particular um, binding activity, for example, or perhaps a surprising route of administration, perhaps a transdermal route for an antibody fragment where um, uh, a full antibody couldn't be administered in this way because it wouldn't penetrate the epidermis, for example. So all of this requires data. If you do not have the data in your application to demonstrate that you have these surprising advantages, then the EPO will not grant you an inventive step. So the message here is really to carefully a plan the research and be keep a discussion going with the inventors about the panel of um, leads that they identify and what kind of advantage do they provide? What kind of features do they have? Are they a me too? Or do they do, they do something different than the known antibodies to, to that target? And it's really important to create a story for the examiner. You don't necessarily have to set out the story in the patent application, you need the data, but in your in your um, file in your records, you need to have that story ready. You need to be able to um, to argue that at the later point in time. You know, maybe three years after you file the application, you need to keep a record of what you discussed with the inventors and what the special advantages are that the antibody has. So it's it's really important to determine that throughout the course of the um, the the project and certainly when you prepare the application and, and of course the the project should in some ways also be guided by that i mean hopefully it all goes hand in hand because you don't want to create a me too antibody because you want to put something towards the market or for the investors where you can say oh this is generally different than you know, volume up or pembrolism up or whatever is out there this has some advantages so hopefully this goes all hand in hand the data package for um, approval, et cetera, of clinical trials and the data package for the patent. But the, the point is you really need to show the examiner that there's something special, something, something different about your antibody beyond the structural difference of the sequence. So I'll just pause here because that's a lot to digest and I can see that I've only got 20 minutes uh, left. So, but I'll just want to pause here just in case that there, if there are any questions on, um, on inventive step. And especially Laura, I, I don't know if that's sort of be, be, been helpful. I, I think probably, and I know you work a lot in this area, we could probably talk half an hour just on inventive step and, and that could be an entirely separate presentation, but, but hopefully this gives you a, a bit of an, of an overview to, um, to, to refresh 
Um. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's really useful. Thanks, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Dima mm -hmm. here from uh, Lonza and Phase 2 Therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I did hear that uh, some people like to also patent the uh, wild type sequence when they have a hybridoma and later on the improved sequence where they mm. did further humanization and optimization of the sequence. Um, is that really a benefit or would it actually expose yourself when uh, you, you do this two-step mm. approach? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think there is a bit of a danger there because it depends a bit on the timing but if you're if you're taking that approach and you are filing an application to the wild type sequence and then you have the publication 18 months later and if you haven't filed for your improved molecule before your own application publishes then of course that publication creates a prior art record and then you have you have to argue against your prior own prior art and if you do um if you do your and i think because I think the examiner will say, well, humanization is trivial, it's routine, you know which residues to target. I think that'd be very difficult to demonstrate an inventive step. Novelty you have because the residues are different, but to actually demonstrate the inventive step there, that it's not obvious to humanize, very difficult, if not impossible. If you make a change that creates uh, some improved binding, then that's arguable because you wouldn't perhaps know that if you change this residue, it would have such a massive effect. That said, if you create a change to, to remove a common liability, you know, some deamination site or whatever liability there is, again, that's pretty routine, isn't it? So you, you, you yeah. will struggle on inventive steps. So I, I would probably caution against that strategy, I have to say. Okay, yeah, sounds good to have some caution there. I mm, um... have to be careful. I mean, you can if you can work out the timing um, in such a way that you can make your second application before the, the early application publishes, or you add that data in the priority period. So you, you file your first application, you've got 12 months to add data. If you can get that data together for your subsequent, subsequent PCT filing, then I think you are, you are, you're good then. Um, well, you, you should be, depends a bit on if others publish in the priority period, but let's not overcomplicate it. So there, there's different there's different strategies there, but I think it's something that you need to really look at carefully. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So timing is really timing. crucial here. Timing. That, uh... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, many thanks. Okay. Um, Hi, Barbara, sorry, yeah, there's um, yeah. a question in the mm -hmm. chat. Would you like to take that now or...? or... Do you yes, want to please, yeah. yeah. So it's can you explain more on the role of ADCs in securing antibody therapeutic patent application success? Hmm. Yeah, very, very briefly. So, I mean, in, in, with ADCs, again, it's a crowded field. Um, so, obviously, ADCs have been around for um, a while. There are uh, payloads that are known, um, there are linkers that are known. Um, so, if you um, it depends on where, where your focus is. If you create a new linker, great. You know, if you can show that there's some advantage to the linker, fantastic. If you create a new toxin, again, you know, great. That that's new and that's surprising and that works perhaps better than other toxins. Wonderful. If you choose um, an antibody, if you make an antibody against a known target, um, and that antibody is then used in an ABC format where where others have already suggested to use that antibody in an ADC format. You, you have exactly the same problems that I outlined with inventive step. You, know, you need, to, need to argue that there's something special. Is there something special about the particular ADC that you created, the particular combination of antibody linker toxin? Even if the components of the linker and the toxin have been known before, is there some unexpected result that you are getting? So in, with, in terms of inventive step, it's, it's, it's very similar considerations, it has to be something special. And again, the space is really crowded. So that's just a really, really brief comment on, on ADCs. Um, I'd just like to move on because I can see we're sort of uh, you know, 15 minutes before time is over. I don't want to go too much into detail. The, the, um, I'm sure you all have access to the um, presentation. I've just put up a few examples, but I really want to get on to freedom to operate. Um, just put up a few, cl few claims here. This, this just shows you that 
you need to put in the CDR. So that's what, what's been done here. That's a, that's a case I prosecuted that recently has been granted. It's, it's an antibody that binds specifically to like PDL1. That, that was the argument that we successfully made. That was what made it special, the binding to the glycosylated PDL1, which wasn't in the art. But of course, we had to define the CDR sequences. Um, all of pharmaceuticals, uh, an older patent, pretty broad claim here of use of a PD1 antibody without the structural feature, because it, 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 that was you know, the first time that the antibody was used for this particular purpose. So they got a broad claim. Very dense claim here, but this is like another PD-1 antib antibody when the ONO antibody was already known. So of course they had to come down on something much narrow with their antibody, because they had to um, they had to be aware of that prior art, which already disclosed PD-1 antibodies. PD-1 antibodies were well known when Novartis filed the application. They are a chief brand of this antibody, but they had to define the CDRs here, as, as you can see in this rather dense claim. Inventive step arguments were made. They demonstrated superior effects, superior characteristics of the antibody. So they, they were in that situation where the examiner said, what's special about your antibody? PD-1 antibodies are known. Tell me what's different. And they did. They, they, could, they could argue that successfully. I'm just going to skip over the next examples because I really want to get on to FTO, except if you call on your so experience is that the US is less strict on inventive step. So, I have often seen that the US grants broader claims. Um, so even if you run into trouble in Europe, don't despair. You might still get a patent in the US, which is, of course, such a big market. And we all want patents in the US. Um, that said, there is some very recent case law, which, which seems to suggest that the EPO might be tightening their requirements specifically on sufficiency enablement. So that's just a kind of watch this space. But I can certainly say that my experience with the USPTO has been better because I think the EPO's requirement on inventive step is particularly harsh when it comes to antibodies. So that is my personal, my personal view. FTO then. So quick run through FTO. I'm sure you're you're all aware, um, you know, why you would want to do an FTO. Very important for small companies, startup companies, um, the investors want to see that you have thought about FTO and you can demonstrate that there is freedom to operate for, for the product. That you, They want to see you've done your homework. Very clear. I've helped a lot of companies in due diligence exercise. I've spoken to many investors, VCs, um, big pharma companies, and that is what they want to see. They want to see that you've done your homework. Of course, you ultimately want to secure market access. You don't want to infringe other parties' rights, you do not want to get drawn into litigation. That's the last thing you want to get drawn into. It's very expensive and, and not advisable. So you need to clear the pass. So what does an FTO um, actually look at? So it's it, it looks at whether your invention, your product will infringe um, any third party right that is valid. Um, and the way it's done is a search and an assessment of third party rights in the patent space. And, and as I said before, some of these areas are super crowded, um, especially when it comes to IO targets. There is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of patents out there that need to be considered. The when is really important. I would always say do this at the earliest stage because R&D takes a long time. Um, money is spent on R&D, on the patents, et cetera. And you don't want to be in a situation where you get ready for your clinical trial and you suddenly realize, oops, there's a problem. And I need, I need a license from this big pharma company and they're not going to give me a license. So <laughs> don't want to be in that situation. So as early as possible would be my recommendation. This gives you a clear position before the project is even started. So if you're looking at targets, check what's out there. And um, we come to, to how you check, but, but that, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that you don't, um, you don't tread on anybody's toes and you can demonstrate to the inventors that you have freedom to operate. It gives obviously direction to the research. So if you come across a stumbling block, maybe there is a patent where there's a certain epitope that the antibody binds to. I did say that such claims are difficult, but for the sake of argument, just assume that there's a patent which has a binder to um, um, an IO target and, and it's defined by epitope binding. 
Now, if you know that, you can work around it. You know, you could try and develop good molecules that don't bind to the same epitope, bind to a different epitope. So, so that gives your research some direction. The disadvantage is it's a moving field. You, you've got to keep on top of it. It's not a one FTO and that's fine. And you just go ahead for the next five years and do all the experiments you want. You do need to, to check what's out there continuously. Um, because patent applications publish 18 months after the filing date. So before they publish it, you don't know what's out there. Of course, patents grant, they're pending and then they grant. So you really need to be aware of the space and update your searches. Absolutely key is setting the right parameters. This is so important. I can't emphasize this enough. It, it, you can spend lots of money on a search. If you don't get the parameters right, your output is it is not useful to you. And these searches are unfortunately expensive because the, the space is, is so popular for some of these targets. So there are different ways of doing the search. And depending on how you do it, um, this determines how much it costs. So you really need to think about this very carefully. Um, I think often people I talk to don't, don't appreciate how much work goes into just setting this the search. Um, I work with a specialist search company. It's actually based in Boston. They, they specialize in, in um, these kind of searches. There are, there are lots of companies out there, also good UK companies, but the one that I, I work with happens to be in Boston. And I, I have you know, several hours of discussion with them on different strategies, different parameters, checking the kind of hits we get with certain parameters, the volume of how many hits do we get? Is it achievable to look through the hits? I can't look through 2000 hits and give you an opinion and 2000 hits, it's simply impossible. So really setting a parameter in a, in a way that you get a useful output that is manageable from time and cost perspective is, is absolutely paramount. And the way to do it is you need to have um, Know, a list of different criteria and, and really see how you can combine them to arrive at a good, a good search. Are you looking at patents, granted patents only? That's a good starting point. Are you looking at pending applications already? That might increase the number of hits significantly. What jurisdictions are you interested in? US, Europe, other jurisdictions? If you're interested in China, Japan, that will be very difficult um, and, and expensive if you want extra searches there but better to stick to Europe and the US and then check for other family members in say China and Japan. So there are, there are ways around this. Use the right keywords, very important. Combine target keywords with, with certain other parameters, perhaps to, to limit the number of hits. Patent classifications can be used as an additional tool. Do you know of certain entities that are active? That might be a good starting point. If you give us a list of entities, or we work with you to establish that then we can limit the number of hits significantly. At least that's a good starting point for what's out there. If there's already a, um, an absolutely red flag, no point looking at a wider search because there was already a red flag and you can't proceed. So that's a way of doing it. Looking at various date limitations, how far back do you want to go? Patent term is 20 years, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's something to look at as well. So different strategies, combining the different strategies, I think that's, that's the most pragmatic approach. But, but as I wanted to stress with you, is, is really this is so important to get the parameters right. In terms of what's next, you can make an assessment your, yourself. You can work with external counsel. I think that the assessment you can make yourself is a, a little bit limited because this is quite specialist knowledge. I mean, you need to assess the granted claims. You know, sometimes people are not very well versed in navigating the databases and sometimes clients get worried and they come to me and say, oh, I found this granted patent and such a broad claim. I don't understand how did they get this granted? And then I look at it and actually what they, re what they didn't realize was that this was the publication of the pending application. It wasn't what was granted, the granted claims in a different document, they're much more limited. So that's great. I can reassure the client that there's not a problem, but I'm, I'm just saying you need to just know how to navigate your way around the patents. Um, and you sure that's not too difficult and that can, can be learned, but, but just as a, as a flag that you need to know how to do that. If you're looking for pending claims, you need to know where to find them. You need to know um, about expiry dates. In the US, the expiry date can be beyond the 20 year term because they're 
granted extra days for delays in the prosecution. So you need to be aware of that. You need to check for divisional applications. There's, 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 a lot, there's a lot you need to know. You can make some assessment, but I think it's probably best to work with external counsel specifically when it comes to the assessment of the claims and the language and what do the claims actually cover? How are the claims interpreted? Now, that's really important. Um, just going to quickly rush to the last slide. The questions again for those who want to stay on for questions. I'm happy to stay on. Um, but just to wrap this up, as I said, updating the search is really important. Publications um, are made 18 months after the filing date. So before that, you don't know what's out there. And if you're looking at pending applications, you need to monitor how they develop. Are they being granted? Are the claims changing, etc.? cetera? Um, now, what do you do if the pass is not clear? That's always you know, a big question. People say, well, why, why should I do this? What do I do when, when, when the pass is not clear? There are, there are possibilities of um, taking, taking action. And, and for example, you can develop a workaround like my, my example was the epitope claim, try and find binders that bind to different epitopes. So you can, you can steer the research. You can consider obtaining a license if there's a real blocker. You can consider if there are actually some exemptions from infringement, and, and there are some exemptions. I won't go into detail, but it's an analysis that should be made. If none of this works, um, you know, it, it, are those patents or the patent you identified as a stumbling block valid? Can you take legal action? Obviously, the, that's not a great route because that's expensive. But there is, for example, an opposition um, period in Europe where you can take, attack a granted patent. It's something to consider. And as the last resort, you know, if it's really, you know, that's a target you identified. Absolutely, too many stumbling blocks. You can't work with that target. You'd have to get multiple licenses, etc. You know, maybe it's time to look at a different target. Unfortunately. So that's that's sort of the final thoughts I wanted to leave you with. And I know I know I'm bang on time, but I really want to take questions. So I'm very happy to to hang on and and, and wait a bit more for you know questions. Um, people want to run through some questions. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry it's a bit it's been a bit rushed, but I really wanted to to run you through the FEO thoughts. Barbara, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. It's a one-stop shop for everything to do with um, antibody patents. So thank you. Um, yes, I will just, uh, before I end the session, we'll just give delegates one last opportunity um, to unmute um, or, or use the chat box if you have any burning questions for Barbara. silence but um uh, from from what i can see in the chat and from the interaction um during the session uh that was extremely useful barbara thank you so much um so just to highlight the recording um will be available by the conference app um for four weeks post the event um if anybody is interested in um linking up directly with barbara you can do so via the conference app or um, if you'd like to, to reach out to me directly, I can pop my email address in the chat box and I'd be very happy to do an introduction by email um, to Barbara for you. Uh, so just to, oh, sorry, Barbara. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I feel I'm very happy um, for people to email me. My, my email is, is shown on, on the slide now and you can also look me up, um, Apple Yard Lease. So if you want to contact me directly, that, that, that's absolutely fine. If you've got any questions, any burning antibody questions that you couldn't run past me today, please feel free to contact me. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so it's up to me now just to, to bring the session to a close. So um, our next innovation workshop is today with Medadia at 3 p.m. on regulatory compliance in MedTech. In the meantime, there is, of course, other on-demand content that you can access via the conference app or use it to make connections with other delegates. So with that, um, thank you all very much to, um, for joining and uh, to Barbara, of course, for that um, very thorough, engaging presentation. And um, I, I wish you all um, a good rest of the day and hope to see you online on the app. Many thanks. Thank you, Barbara. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.